Hi everybody, it's Kevin Raber and uh, we are sitting on the back deck of my house on an absolutely gorgeous day here in Indianapolis. I've brought Michael Durr back in to uh, spend a little time with us doing some videos this morning and sitting with me today is my good friend and esteemed colleague and person I look up to a whole lot, Brooke Jensen and uh, he's spending a couple days here with me and we've been having a blast, went out and did a great dinner, some great conversation. Uh, this morning I showed Brooke a demonstration of chat GPT and it wrote his whole history for him, which he's still <laughs> a little mind boggled by. Yeah. But I think part of what he and I are sitting here today is something along the line of, you know, what GPD is. Um, here we are in the photography industry and um, we've, we've been in this photography industry, both of us since about 1972. So collectively, and it's a scary thought process is there's probably over what a hundred and some odd years of total photographic experience, uh, addressing you today. Uh, and we both have a great sense of humor and love with a passion that we can't even describe what we do and the journeys we've, we've been on, but uh, kind of like to talk to you a little bit today about what we see or what we're seeing um, in the change of photography. And, you know, kind of to kick it off and then let Brooks kick in is the fact that, you know, we brought, were brought up in a time where we loaded film into cameras, we had to focus, we had to adjust an f-stop to make sure the exposure was right, and we had to be good enough to do it quickly enough so that we could capture the pictures. And of course, then, you know, we had to take all this film in the dark room and wind it onto reels and eventually uh, put it in a bunch of chemistry and uh, take that out, look at it, then put it in a larger, and then put it on a piece of paper. And, you know, it was um, a routine. It troubles me when I look at what I'm getting here. And this is the new iPhone 16 Pro Max. And um, a lot of people call it a phone. I actually call it a camera with a phone because really I think the camera is out taking the purpose of a purposeful of phone. We really don't see much advancements in the phone, but we're seeing a lot of advancements and the capability of of these cameras and I think it's a, a warning sign to us uh, a lot of us need to look at this is wow where is photography going and I think that's the general direction I kind of want to uh, take the conversation now I have a lot of opinions but I'm going to kind of throw it over a book here and say what what where do you see it going I mean we're all watching the same thing you know you talk to a lot more photographers than I do in regards to the lens work publication by the way publisher of lens work magazine that uh, is just probably most of the most esteemed magazine you can have. Still being published, one of the last published magazines on photography in this country with no advertising. Anyway, <laughs> it has been a strange ride, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you. Do you do you remember coating glass plates and making oh, those yeah. Civil War photographs that you and I did? <laughs> did we, <laughs> with the cannons going off next. With the cannons <laughs> going off next. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I I distinctly remember. When I, when I got a handle on the zone system, after all those years studying with, yep. you know, the Ansel Adams books, the Fred Picker books, the Minor White books, etc., and I thought, okay, I think I understand what's going on with the zone system. That's the last thing I'll need to learn in photography. Yes. You know, who could have predicted what has come about in the last 30 years? It, it's it's mind-boggling. I'm not sure at that pace that it's possible to look forward and think what's going to happen in the next 30 years when we look back and see what happened in the last 30 years. I wrote an article in the early days of lens work and said, if I could wave a magic wand and make my wish come true, I would wish for a camera that was the size of a pack of cigarettes that I could put in my pocket and make a gorgeous 8x10. Yeah. Now, you know, you can take that camera and put it in your pocket and make a gorgeous 42-inch print. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it's scary. It is scary. And, but, but on the other hand, uh, I'm encouraged by the direction that photography is taking because it's becoming so easy from a technological point of view that people who are interested in photography for only mastering technology, there's not much there. So what's left is all the people who are interested in using a camera to be an artist. And that's a different thing from being just a photographer. Uh, I have to clarify that because I don't want to insult photographers. But photography is a personally expressive art medium. is no different than any other 
personally expressive art medium, be it painting or sculpture or poetry or writing novels. It, it, it's not the technology that makes the artwork. It's the human being that makes the artwork. And the fact that we can now put more of our time into the artistic aspects and less time into the technical aspects is ultimately, I believe, I hope, a good thing. I, I, I truly think it is. I mean, first off, you know, I, I think it was Jay Mizell who always said, you know, the, the best camera you have is the camera you have with you. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a lot of us would never haul our Nikon with motor drive and a big 24, you know, 50 millimeter lens on it over our shoulder when we went to the restaurant mm -hmm. or, you know, as we walk down the street or through the mall. Mm -hmm. But now we have a camera I and mean, a really capable camera yeah. that is always with us. I know. And even yeah. with this new one, they make it so easy. All you got to do is pull out of your pocket and push one button, and the camera is activated. And then you just got to slide your finger on the thing, and it turns into a zoom lens. And boom, you can catch shots that you could never catch with the spontaneity. But all of that doesn't make it better artwork. Doesn't. I mean, that's the point is... Well, here's my way of thinking at it anyway, is I used to spend 80% of my creative time struggling with the technology, recalcitrant molecules, trying to make prints look like I wanted them to look, and 20% of my time thinking about the artistic aspects and what I wanted to say and the personally expressive components. Now, the technology has become easy enough that I can spend 80% of my time thinking about artistic expression and 20% of my time wrangling molecules. And that's ultimately a fantastic trend. Now, whether or not photographers are going to catch up to that is another question because photography has been technology-driven for so many decades that it's, it's still easy for today's photographers to be impressed by the advance of technology. But the advance of technology, if it's not in service of more creative personal expressions, it's, it's a trick of manufacturing, not necessarily a useful creative tool, unless you turn it into a useful creative tool. I've often referred to it as camera as Xerox machine. We don't need more pictures of the world. One of the damn things is enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't remember now who said it, but the point is the... The trillions, literally trillions of photographs that are being made today, most of them, you know, they're, they're copies of the world. And that's not what counts in the art sense. In the art side, in yep. the, When you're going to make artwork, it better not just be a copy of what the world looks like. It better be something that's a personal response. That's why uh, I, I've started thinking more and more about response to the world rather than taking a picture of the world. I think that, that but seeing the, the response in the world, seeing the world, you know, seeing the things that are placed in front of you and being able to see with a frame around it to realize that, hey, there's a lot more pictures here than we thought and we don't need to get the big camera out because I have the small camera. Mm -hmm. And I think the trick really at least probably for the rest of our lifetime, is how a camera sort of, in this sense, which is very capable, mm -hmm. next year I have 348 megapixel mm -hmm. uh, sensors inside it, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot more capability as far as the, the telephoto goes, probably mm -hmm. accomplishes 70 or more percent of the photography that's needed for what people shoot and take. Mm -hmm. But the marriage of when do I use this camera versus when do I use one of my larger uh, type cameras? It's, I, I'm proposing that's not a technological question. You don't think so? No. I think it's an artistic question. Well, okay. And, and for, I'm, I can only speak for me at this point, but when I pick up my phone, I just have a difficult time thinking creatively and artistically as compared to when I pick up a camera. That's and and so my mind shifts a little bit when I pick up my camera. Somehow I'm doing something more purposeful, more intense, more meaningful to me. Now, other people can, uh, can make that switch between a camera and a phone or maybe only use a phone. Good for them. But the point is, each one of us, I think, needs to figure that out for ourselves, is where, what, what tools, be they cameras or darkrooms or printers or whatever, 
what tools are the ones that support our creative vision and what tools get in the way or maybe we, we just can't get ourselves in the right mindset to use them more creatively. We have to make intelligent decisions about tools. And, well, let me ask you this. In the history of photography, is there a generation of photographers that did not see a radical change in equipment? Well, no, maybe not. I mean, I think... I mean, think back. 60s, for, 70s, and early 80s, we didn't see anything radical. Then an autofocus came in, auto exposure came in. Yeah, that's pretty radical well, I compared guess it to. It might the be pretty radical, but the interchange cameras were basically interchangeable the same. lenses came about. And, you know, well, small lenses, then, then uh, metering and sensors. And certainly in the darkroom, we had way better materials to, to print with in the 70s and 80s than they had in the 30s and 40s. Every generation of photographers from the history of photography has gone through some sort of technological change, and we're no different. And, and the next generation is going to have something different than iPhones. But the digital transition was, I was pretty sweeping, pretty fast, and, and hard to swallow. Because even if, sure. if I was, if, if I, in 70s or 80s or even the 90s, if somebody would have told me, well, you know, 20 years you'll just be shooting without film and you know you'll be shooting better pictures than you ever did before and you're making prints without chemistry mm -hmm. and you know you'll be sending and sharing your pictures to people all over the world in a matter of seconds from your camera i mean some of those things are pretty astounding they are pretty astounding but i've said for years now well i won't be around to prove whether or not this is accurate well, now you're here <laughs> but but i've said for years now that when historians look back at this 50 or 100 years from now at the times we're living through they're not going to think that capture was the real revolution the real revolution is distribution this and the sharing. way we can share our images mm -hmm. so instantaneously globally well we talked about starting our photography in the 70s we, we would have an incredibly successful moment in our photographic careers if we were allowed an exhibition in our town that got, what, maybe a hundred people to view the images for 30 days that lived within about Driving 60, 60 miles of, our, of the gallery. Yes, yes. Now we can get millions of people to see our images almost instantly. That's the real revolution. And and the challenge there is, with all of those photographers and all those cameras and all those images, how do you get people to care to look at your images? That's, That's a, not a technological question. Well, I think that also now evolves into the way that people use uh, and take their pictures and do different things with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a number of different styles, whether it's camera movement mm -hmm. or uh, what's it, the Perpetso or the Venezzo. I mean, there's a number of different... Um, ways of, of shooting and using the tools <clears throat> to change the look of the image. Mm -hmm. You know, you can almost, you know, have a style. And I guess mm -hmm. that's one of the secrets is how to use these tools to design a style that somebody looks at and says, that must be a raver. Well, here, <clears throat> here's the real question. Where is the, where is the line that divides style from gimmick? That's the operative question. Well, of course, the question is, can you use the gimmick in conjunction with your photography to define a style. Exactly. Or to find a more powerful personal expression. That's the <clears> real, <throat> we keep coming back to the same idea over and over again is how do you make a photograph that's meaningful, that touches you, that might touch other people. And by the way, if it doesn't, if it touches you, that's what really oh, counts, oh, that's isn't the it? That's the most you know, important part. We'll, you set that another, for another discussion. Yeah. But the, the point is, that you and I can do things that previous photographers could only dream of. Fabulous, wonderful, isn't that great? But if we don't use these wonderful tools to make more meaningful expressions, more personal expressions, but, you know, more wonderful photographs, then we've kind of squandered the technology. So it's great that we have it, but, w but it comes with a responsibility to be even better, more sensitive artists than the previous generations. And that's not easy. It's not easy, but it's maybe up to us. I mean, I teach yeah. a number of different courses at the art center here in town. 
And one of them that I try to teach is obviously I teach a mobile photography course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have three challenges. There's technology mm -hmm. in here that has to be learned and used. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a matter of a slider or a button and a couple settings. And once you set it, it's kind of forget it. Mm -hmm. But then it's, you know, talking and doing a couple things that I challenge the, the students with. Mm -hmm. so number one, you still got to feel with your heart. That's right. You got to feel with your heart. You got to see with your eyes. A lot of times these days, you have to use the audio that goes with it. Mm -hmm. and then you got to say to yourself, what's the story? Mm -hmm. I still think some of the things that um, we've heard during the day, the form, the gesture, and all the, the pieces and parts that, that come into it play an important part. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is now is, in, you know, folks that have had the experience that we have is to become the teachers to help today's photographers learn how to take the technology and what we've learned over the years of seeing and composing mm -hmm. and contemplating and, you know, doing the things that we did to make the art that we've done mm -hmm. and teach them how to do the same thing with the new tool. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember, who was it that said, you don't make photographs with your eyes, you make photographs with your heart? It's a great quote, but I can't remember now. Know, my friend it, Steve but... Gosling talks a lot about the heart. I used to kind of joke with him and say, yeah, I like, right, I really feel with my heart. I see with my eyes. I know what I'm taking a picture of. Yeah. And then I did, you know, after a while there, I actually realized Steve actually might know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. and, and there is a lot to say about the heart. Um, you know, it's so easy to take a picture that the question really comes, why did I take that picture? Exactly. And I, I ask myself that many times when I take the picture. Yeah. Okay, I want to take it, but why did I take it? Well, the way, I, the way I've often put it is this. Uh, you and I are both landscape photographers. We're out there in the landscape. We pass hundreds, maybe thousands of trees that we don't photograph. But that tree catches us for some reason. We say, I'm going to make a picture of that tree. If we don't understand why that tree is different from all the other trees, then have we really accomplished anything? It's why do we make... A picture of that tree, that rock, that iceberg in your case, that, you know, um, I can... that, that's what it really comes down to is because somehow we've made a connection. I'm convinced, I, I can't prove this, but I'm convinced that a lot of those connections happen on a subconscious level. We may not even know why yeah, we yeah. make the tree, but, but in the process of making the photograph, maybe that's part of the pursuit is to try to figure out why that tree and that photograph and that light and that composition and all of that was meaningful and somehow communicate that through the photograph, which is hard. It, it is hard. When we do a fine art printing class, and one, what's fun to do is a lot of people shoot a lot of these pictures and finally they decide one of these pictures I want to commit to a piece of paper. Uh -huh. And as we start putting the paper up, you know, we throw it up on the inspection light table and, uh -huh. you know, we end up talking about why did you shoot this? Uh -huh. And it's actually pretty interesting. Most of the people, if they've committed to that far, have a reason why they were shooting mm -hmm. and what they were seeing. Uh -huh. And of course, then we have to show a little bit about, well, did you really need this and we you really need that? If mm -hmm. what you were shooting is this, then you don't need, you know, four inches of dark blue sky. Right. right. You know, you, and, you know, you, do you need the distractions here and try to end up, mm -hmm. you know, beginning to form the image, which then turns into more of the maturity of seeing the next time you're out in the field of something similar that makes you think that way. So yeah, you get the, yeah, yeah. it's a refinement now of, you know, going this far, learning, taking it back and learning and that instinctiveness comes from a repeatability of being uh, critical of, of your work yourself if you're trained mm -hmm. to do it or, you know, with the help of other people, so. But you bring up another issue that I think is really interesting in our day, and that's you, you, what, what you just described. You go out, you make a bunch of photographs, you pick the one that you want to commit to print. I'm finding that less and less um, attractive to digital photographers in particular. Because in, in my day, when I started with film, for example, I'd go out photographing for a weekend and I had 48 sheets of film that I could put in my film holders. That was as many film holders as I had. And so I would come back with, hopefully, 48 exposures that I might be able to choose one of to print and mat and frame and put on the wall. Now we go out for a weekend, we come back with 1,500 exposures, and to pick one and put it on the wall is questionable for several reasons not the least of which is that does that mean all the rest of them are bad photographs or maybe do we start thinking more and more in terms of groups 
we start thinking in terms of small projects and yeah. then all of a sudden seeing in sixes and chat books and exhibitions and PDFs and all that start making more sense so that photographers are, are starting to think more in terms of groups, at least that's what I'm seeing in, in a trend in photography. Groups and days. projects. Well, we talk a lot groups about that projects. in the program because so many people associate a print that you select that has to go big to hang on a wall. Where That's one form of photography. But, That's one and media. That, but usually there's a an adventure or something that led up to that. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times there's a repeatability of something that works like that. Like this mm -hmm. afternoon, you and I are going to be working with a project I've been working on called Rust. Mm -hmm. And it's been a worldwide adventure for over uh, decades of photographing rusty things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a project. Mm -hmm. And I've had a project of double exposure squares. I mean, I might be working on a series of different projects at one time along the way. I have a new series I started out my hotel window, you know, which Every time I stay in a hotel room, shoot something out a window. Mm -hmm. And you've got similar things where you're working on half a dozen things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where we're, we're, we're going with our photography. But, but that, in that sense, that's... photography is changing. Yeah. It used to be the single image uh -huh. exclusively. Now we can add to the single image the multiple image project, which we can present in a variety of ways. Diptychs, triptychs, etc. Yeah. Small books, blur books. Uh, web presentations, etc. And as photographers start thinking more in terms of multiple images, that changes their relationship to the world in a way that I think is fascinating. Well, we're, it's an exciting time. You know, we can go on and on about this, and I, I, I do hope that we'll have a, an ability to do more of these as, as we go. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, at least for our audience, so we don't lose our audience, we, we need to be <laughs> a little aware that, you know, what we're trying to encourage all of you with... Your cameras, whether they're iPhones or uh, your Nikons or Canons or Olympuses or Sonys, it doesn't really matter what camera you have because nobody ever asks that when they're looking at your images. So what difference does it make as long as you had a camera that works for you? What's really important is the thing that counts, and that's the picture that we make with those cameras. And the experience that you have when you're in pursuit of those. You know, really, I've always said that if... All the world leaders and everybody would just pick up a camera. You'd be amazed at how happy people can be <laughs> and how photography can tie all the good things in the world together. And, you know, it is the, it is, makes history. Pictures have made our history and they have for a long time and they will continue to change and be part of that making. But, you know, sharing your pictures with people you know, sharing them with the world now mm -hmm. really, really defines a lot of things. And I think that's part of what it's all about. You know, contribute your, your art, your vision to the world. And while it might affect only five people or it might affect millions of people, you know, that's just what's going to happen along the way. But pictures is my happy place. And <laughs> I think... Ooh, that's a good quote. <laughs> and, but I think it's all of our happy place. Yeah, we, yeah. we haven't come this far consistently, never changing career... Being in this one industry, one way or another, all about pictures all the time mm -hmm. and helping other people enjoy the art of photography. Yep. And your magazine does a great job of that. Thanks. Lens work. Thanks. Brooks, thanks very much as always. As always. Here. It's been a pleasure having you as a guest at my house. Hopefully it's just not a, a one-time deal and we always have Zoom in other ways and I'll come out and visit you again and we'll meet on the road. There's lots of possibilities, but uh, hope you enjoyed this little conversation and uh, Thanks for being part of PXL. And once again, Brooks, thanks for thanks. being part of this with me. Thanks.